The International Monetary Fund presented its regional economic outlook for sub-Saharan Africa with a focus on policy and structural reforms issues which may impede growth. The IMF mission chief and senior resident representative for Nigeria, Amin Mati, spoke on the heterogeneity of different countries and the need to reduce debt through fiscal consolidation, reduction in financial constraints and the effect of trade tensions on the growth in the sub-Saharan African regions. He particularly expressed concerns on the lag in economic growth of the three largest countries which should drive growth in the sub-Saharan African region. The three largest countries, which are the ones that are really driving sub-Sahara growth, Angola, South Africa, and Nigeria, and you can see here, are lagging. Uh, Angola with negative growth, South Africa a growth below 1%, and Nigeria growth between 2 and 2.5%, which is still negative per capita growth. I know some in the room here, every time I'm in Nigeria, say, oh, but we're still doing better than South Africa. Yeah, but you still need to be higher. I mean, the median, is, when, when you're looking at it, I mean, Nigeria is, is at the, the first three quarters, the numbers that came out is 2.2%. Um, so, you know, our forecast is 2.3% for the year. I think it's still on track, depending on where agriculture and ICT and some of those sectors are going to come up. But the average for the region, the weighted average is 32 so 3.2% was in 2019, same growth rate as 2018. And then for 2020, for the region, we project 3.6%. Now, that growth, Nigeria is still at 23 For 2020, we're still projecting it at 25 So it's still not uh, growing as fast as the others uh, for a variety of reasons, including on some of the uh, structural reforms uh, and others. Over the next decade, what we are estimating is that 20 million new people will be joining the job market in the Africa sub-Saharan region. This 20 million new labor entrants is these 20 million new jobs that need to be created through structural reforms, whatever reforms that are being pursued. Now, so far, we have been able to create only 10 million jobs. So we need to create, to do a lot better than what we have been doing because it's 10 million new jobs that are coming and that need to be created going forward. We were able to get the data for 30 countries and we looked at what is happening with domestic arrears that are quite prevalent in Africa. So Africa is not the only region that has domestic arrears, but it is one of the regions that may have the most compared relative to, to, to others. And in percent of GDP, it's about 3.3% of GDP. This is affecting the most low income, some that are less low income, mostly reflecting weaknesses in budget execution, in PFM, and that need to be fixed. Why is our domestic careers a problem? It impacts private sector, it impacts private sector investment, it impacts banks' asset quality, which will also impact how they are lending. So the chapter we have there, is also focusing on that uh, particular uh, issue. In the case of Nigeria, there are also domestic careers. And the domestic careers uh, here, some of them to contractors, some of them to fuel operators, the government is trying to clear them through the promissory notes. That is part of trying to uh, restore uh, confidence in the system by the private sector and making sure that the stock of domestic careers are being reduced. If inflation is too high, do you have space to use monetary policy to try to encourage growth? Uh, some of the countries have that. Do you have space to loosen fiscal policy? Well, then you have to look at how sustainable your debt level is. And in most of the countries, there's little space, so fiscal consolidation, <coughs> revenue-driven is, is there. And then you may have room to use monetary policy if inflation is low. Also, Bismarck Rwani, the MD CEO at Financial Derivatives, spoke on the need for a more competitive market and also the need for structural changes. And competition obviously makes markets more perfect and reduces margins. And imperfect markets are usually products of a rent-seeking uh, economic model. And so you would have a lot of interest groups saying no, Let's, let's close down things, let's block things, let's close the borders, let's do this. Because those are anti-competitive moves. 
And so the trade-off between encouraging competition and protecting domestic industry is an issue that uh, philosophically policymakers have to come to terms with. And so it is very important, I think, this and you structural changes are necessary to get growth above a particular level. The revenue, all the uh, revenue to GDP ratios and all of these things are interesting ratios, but in the presence of slow growth or suboptimal growth, let me put it this way, because potential GDP is still also growing faster than real GDP. So there's a recessionary gap. There's no question about that. Growth principally is a fiscal issue. And I think, yes, you can support it or you can coordinate it. Um, and dealing with inflation, uh, we had that conversation as well. Dealing with inflation and giving up, not giving up growth. It's not a binary choice. Mm -hmm. But it is a choice that which do you give priority? And then we looked at some of the monetary policy decisions about for liquidity management, Nigerian individuals, corporates, and others are not allowed to buy homo bills because homo bills are for liquidity management, actually. So in that means that since that decision, interest rates have effectively come down by about three to 400 basis points. Um, so that's good in terms of if, if that can be transmitted into lending and lending can be transmitted into activities that will bring growth. But if not, if not, the marginal propensity to save, because savings is a function of interest, all right? And so when the marginal propensity to save actually declines, the major propensity to consume increases because it's consumption plus savings that gives you a total income. Then underneath the marginal propensity to consume is the marginal propensity to import. And so when you do that analysis crudely, it, the law of unintended consequences begins to stare at you. Meanwhile, Dr. Jumoke Oduoli, the special advisor to the president of Nigeria on the ease of doing business, spoke on the progress made in the Nigeria's ease of doing business reform. If Lagos gets it, Nigeria gets it. And if Nigeria gets it, Africa gets it. So if Lagos gets it, Africa gets it. So the ERGP competitiveness pillar is divided into two parts, and I'm sure you know this. The first part on hard infrastructure, roads, power, rail, broadband, airports, seaports. And the second half, which is perhaps for the first time a systemic intervention on regulatory, bureaucratic bottlenecks, we focus on reduction of cost and time, and we focus on making sure that there's more transparency and information in the system. Nigeria is one of only 18 countries that has a subnational doing business report. And we worked with state governments unanimously, everyone across the board got on board, by partnering with the National Economic Council, also chaired by the Vice President. And we had 32 states moving in the right direction, almost 50 reforms implemented at the subnational level. And we continue to partner very closely with state governments. At the end of October, some of you may have heard, we moved up 15 places to 131. Finally, the CEO of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group stressed the need for awareness, urgency, and an enabling environment for businesses to thrive in Nigeria and across board. For us, a few things that we take in government and train them that it's important for us to have clear direction, policy direction, and signal the right environment for money to come in. And we're seeing uh, those are doing well in the sub-region. Usually when I'm in present, I know for course, he wants us to look at the entire sub-region, but then always because we're Nigerians, we look at Nigeria. But if you look at what Ghana is doing, what Ethiopia is doing, the question is that they are not doing anything that is not in the economic text. And how do we get ourselves doing it? So it's about awareness, 
It's about knowing the urgency of the time and the need to do something. And so, for us, key priority is let's deal with macroeconomic stability. Let's continue to try and see what we can do to improve the business environment. And I've challenged my friend and said, there are some low-hanging foods in this ease of doing business thing that we're doing. Now we need to deal with the big issues. Um, Customs, single, uh, since I was young, we were talking about single, single window. And we move from a school that single window, we're still there. What do we need to do around that? People talk about power being a problem in Nigeria. Yeah, it's a power. But then if we pay the right prices, the power will come. For Plus TV Africa, Irene Ubani.